previously on Kerbal Collaborative Warfare. Admiral Regent Beardy Southern Icebird, personal friend of dear leader, struck at the very heart of the Nazis terrorist rebel lands at the KSC-2 and took many of his personnel out following that particular encounter. Nazi terrorist rebel Tape makes a panic counter-attack at KSC-2 before refueling and killing all of his people at Twin Peaks. Chairman Aganarch of A Industries shows the true scope of his folly by continuing to oppose Dear Leader, launching a series of terrorist raids on the northern Clothulians' east coast. The attack craft was lost in the process, and rumours persist of infighting between Aganarch Industries' Kerbals and their unwilling war machines. Hey guys, and welcome back to Kerbal Collaborative Warfare, the version of Kerbal Space Program where we have installed Kerb inside, we have installed BD Armory, we have split up all the bases of Kerb inside amongst us YouTubers, and we have gone to war. What I have for you here today is a hover tank. Now, I know the wheels on the bottom don't make it look all that hovery, but trust me, that's just for getting out of all these tight situations here. Also, one of the things that we have discovered using these hover ports here is it's not a very smart idea to leave it just running on those hover pods. You want some landing gear, landing legs, something between you and the floor, because when you reload, those hover pods don't start immediately, and, you know, all sorts of things can go wrong there. We have many issues that we need to address today, but the one that is most burning in the forefront of Dear Leader's mind is the fact that Aganarch of A Industries swept through the east coast of our lands here and decided to take up residence in Ben Bay. Ben Bay? Blue Bay? Ben Bay. I keep forgetting it mixed up. I ended up uh, at Blue Bay quite a lot when I was trying to sort this out. I was like, wait, wait, this is just some little place in the desert somewhere. I don't need this. Ben Bay up ahead there. That That is where we're going for. Later on, we do also have a request from Penguin. Uh, he wants us to go and make a strike against a certain player. And I think that given what we have laid out in front of us, we can accommodate Penguin in his needs there. You might be questioning me about how effective a hover tank is going to be against a defensive unit as such ferocity as the orb weaver and normally in an open ground situation where anything could happen I would agree with you here but I think Aganarch has made a couple of very serious mistakes with his placement on the orb weavers here so we're going to go take advantage of that. The first thing we need to do though is get outside of this crater. Kerman Lake is of course inside quite a, a serious depression here and we have a near early mission uh, disaster. Thankfully, the anti-grav pods are as close to indestructible as we're allowed to use in this uh, this Kerbal Warfare at the moment. Obviously, the only thing more destructible is that rover body that um, Velox used to use when he was still in the game. Uh, and obviously, we outlawed that because there is literally no way of destroying it. You can, you can launch cruise missiles at it and all you'll do is bat it around the map a little bit. I have a feeling these anti-grav motors are actually the same, but they, they are not system critical to anything so anyway with the, uh, the the near disaster averted and the fact that we're now just crawling up the slope at a very very uh, sedate angle I think what we're gonna do is jump forward a little bit to the next interesting part for a certain given value of interesting of course we of course down towards the beach the first thing that I needed to do was well I thought I was far enough away to now go over onto team B and indeed I was this is mostly due to the fact that I don't have any defenses anywhere around here when Aganarch came storming through he, he did a good job on this coastline um, so yeah you know we'll, we'll deal with that as and when we can but right now I want to talk to you about the shallowness of the beaches around Kerman Lake never before have I encountered a transition between land and water where we can go quite as fast as we had done. As we can see here I made the transition at about 20 meters per second. In my training slash testing missions this was done at something like 30 maybe 40 or 50 meters per second. In fact I knew I made this transition somewhere at the 55 meters per second mark. That was very nail biting and I didn't actually want to do it during my turn here. As we make our way towards Ben Bay, we're going to do a few system checks here, make sure everything's in the cargo bay as intended, uh, and also spend some time looking at the aerodynamic overlay here, because I'm not sure exactly what we're experiencing, what forces are adding up to, to help us here. I know that when I start turning, we get um, we get some, some drag that enables us to actually make a turn whilst under no power, and I wanted to know why that was, and it turns out it's actually all to do with the drag on the anti-grav pods on the side there. Uh, also, quite liking the amount of lift I'm getting off those interceptor missiles. It's, it's all very good. Right, so we're just about to close within 10 kilometers of Ben Bay here, and I should technically be taking it a little bit easy here, but I have noticed something whilst watching everyone's videos. 
nothing happens until 8.7 kilometers. It's, it's only at that point do things start working. And using some of my mods uh, elsewhere in like my cinema save and stuff like that, uh, I have had parts that have been so big you can see them from literally kilometers away. I'll put them at the Kerbal Space Center and you don't even see them until you're eight kilometers close. So I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there. As I say, I've watched everyone else's videos and they also appear to be having the same thing. So I'm not sure how effective this 10 kilometer attack range is, just to bring that up. That, of course, isn't to say that we don't have to be weary. We do indeed have to be very careful. Uh, these, All these vehicles are plastered with missiles that can come at me from almost any angle. But we are going to use that coastline there to our great advantage. Now, when I originally saw this set up here, my first thought was, great. I'll use a howitzer from 10 kilometers away and just kind of snipe him out and, and I'll have no problem here. But one thing that I have found out in the uh, production of this ve vehicle is that the howitzer bullets delete themselves at 5 kilometers, which um, is not very useful. So I've slowed down the footage for us to watch that grey marker on the right there. As we approached within, I don't know, 7 kilometers or so, I can't remember the exact distance, it suddenly makes a jump down, much like flags do. now. I have been told many times that this is because of my terrain detail level. I can tell you right now that that is not the case. I went and checked this out. I do have my terrain detail set to high. I even went and double checked the positioning of both these orb weavers before I came here and did anything and they were both looking fine. Uh, the only thing that I can tell is it seems to be when those interceptor missiles fire and I don't know if that's got anything to do with anything. It just seems to be the one variable that, that is constant throughout everything. And I will show you what I mean in a moment. But first we need to deal with that incoming interceptor. Thankfully went right over my shoulder. Could have gone a lot worse, but, but that's all that's happened. I'm surprised the other orb weaver hasn't started firing at me yet. But at the same time, I was kind of expecting this because of the setup of everything around it. Okay, so what we're going to do now is just kind of float our way over towards that beach over there and set down because trying to set these things down on water and then going to check things leads to all sorts of horrific explosions. My plan was to actually make it to this coastline anyway to actually deal with that orb weaver that had a little bit of an issue there. So this is not too far out of my way. I'm deploying my landing gear here just to start bringing in some drag. I do have rockets on the front and stuff like that to start slowing me down, but I, I don't really feel like I need them that much. I'm just kind of feathering them down to, to, to get into a sort of a close... Uh, close approach speed. I don't really want to come in more than like 10, 10 meters per second or something like that And we're just gonna put down here and go and have a look at what actually happened to that orb weaver Because I'm just as much interested as I'm sure Agonarch is and yes, it's gone under the floor now as I said this bothered me quite a lot because a lot of this has been blamed on the uh, the texture detail but I don't think that's the case and I will now go through the reasoning of why I don't because I then went to go and double check all this like straight away. Citizens, rejoice! It is I your leader, Twitch Yogi, and today I bring you a spectacle unrivaled in the whole of Northern Kabul. The hiding tanks of retribution grow full, and those Kerbals who have spoken against myself, dear leader Switch Shoni, must now face their day of judgment. I have had my latest team of engineers create a new spectacle of death so that we may enjoy their punishment. Our citizens are mandated to watch later today on Cthulhu State TV. Glories. So I made a save, went and rechecked my texture settings, came back and reloaded Agonarch's save. Went off to the space plane hangar, just j threw a random Kerbal into a random cockpit. Went to Blue Bay, cursed myself, came back, went to Ben Bay. At Ben Bay, we double checked that the Orb Weaver was in place, and yes, everything was just as I saw it at the beginning of my turn. For completionist reasons, I then took a copy of the hover tank, went out to 8 kilometers, turned round, changed my team, and started driving back. Uh, around about the 7.1 kilometer mark, exactly the same thing happened as happened in the original save. So, I don't know what you and me want to do about this, Agonarch. Um, obviously, this, this takeover would have been a lot harder with that orb weaver. I had a plan for it, and I will explain during the rest of my turn what my plan was and why I'm quite certain it would have worked but yeah uh, we'll have to talk at some point now that you've seen the full layout of what happened 
reloading the save of my original turn, the, the stuff we've been following the continuity thread of up until this point, I start to have my own collision box issues. I think my landing gear have somehow got glitched out into the floor. I can't seem to bring them up above the level of water. I'm turning on the anti-grav pods and I should be floating around. So I spend some time sort of holding myself up with my jet engines, wiggling about. I spend a vast majority of that time not actually seeing any results of my sort of shuffling around. But eventually we get into this sort of situation where I'm seeing actions resulting from the pressing of keys, but the way that my jet engines are still vastly underwater there worries me a great deal. But we're just going to have to roll with it, try and pray to the glory of leader that everything will hold up if we just slide back, and yes, glories of glories, leader be praised, we managed to come away from a potentially hazardous situation. Okay, and now for the bit that you're actually here for, it's time for my attack run. So the first thing I'm going to do is try and take these hellfires, try and try. I'm going to take these hellfires out of the back of my cargo bay here. I've had a little uh, robotic hinge on the bottom there. That This was surprisingly difficult to set up. I was having a whole whole load of issues with them actually being able to launch from the back of my craft, but we, we managed to get it in the end. Now, you've seen me fire off three hellfire missiles. I would then turn, release the four interceptor missiles towards the orb weaver that was broken, turn back, fire three more hellfires, and then three more hellfires at the orb weaver again. Now, looking at the rate of fire of everything around, I am relatively confident that that attack pattern would have done well. I'm not being attacked on this side of the, the thing, but I can still launch a barrage of trouble over towards him. And that is Agonarch, just to reiterate, is the attack plan that I thought would have done very, very nicely. Next very important step is to disable the hellfires that I'm about to pack away into my cargo bay. I cannot tell you the number of times I was even just sat on the runway and watched the rear end of my vessel explode as all those hellfires got launched into my fuel tanks. Uh, funny every time, but still, it wasn't kind of the idea that I was going for here. So I'm going to use my lateral, uh, lateral rockets here to try and put myself towards the very edge of this little promontory that we see sticking out here. I, my target now is the last remaining orb weaver, and this is the one that I feel I can get right on top of. Uh, the way that Agonarch has set this up around all the buildings, I have this clear path, almost specially designed for the two patriots, Chris Ann and Verdi, to make their way towards it and blow it away like all good hover tanks are des designed to do. Yeah, hover tanks. But first we have the nemesis, feared by hover tanks and Daleks alike. The steep slope. I honestly thought it was going to be a lot easier getting over this slope than it was. And if I had gone, I don't know, maybe five or six meters down to the left, it would have been a lot easier. But that's the way it goes. I didn't really pay much attention to my surroundings at the time. So what I'm trying to do here is try and get my back wheels to get some grip. Because they're the ones that actually have like motors attached to them. This doesn't go well at all. I'm firing off all sorts of different motors to keep me close to the, uh, close to the coastline without getting... Uh, picked up by the orb weaver over there. I do know that I've got quite a lot of uh, clearance for that. Uh, it, looking around, the hangar that the orb weaver is behind gives me quite a lot of cover till quite a way out into the bay. So just sticking close to this land should be more than enough. Uh, I eventually sort myself, sort my angle of approach out and we get to a point where we can actually get out of the way up and over this little promontory here. With only the minimal of transitional problems going from jet engines to landing gear there. Uh, it was a little bit hair raising when we were up on two wheels like that, but everything worked out in the end. These these guys are our crack troops. They're out there doing crack in pipes, as, as, as all my good guys should be. Because, you know, they're addicted and like beholden to me then, right? Indeed, at our training camp, our boys are so coked up to the eyeballs that we have to give our training sergeants methamphetamine and PCP just to keep up with them. And man, those guys know how to party well. There was this one time at boot camp, after the graduation ceremony actually, we started having a little party in the Great Hall. Next thing I know, I wake up halfway around the world, naked, covering burns, and married to a nose cone. <laughs> those guys. So right now I'm having a look at these hellfires in the back here and I'm like, well I brought them for this mission, should we uh, see what we can do with them? So I send off two just to see what the orb weaver's going to do and I notice that my uh, my line of travel might be getting within the orb weaver's line of sight here. I'm like, hmm, that's quite good, I am impressed with how the orb weaver did there, but I think we could do a little bit, a little bit better. I've got all the rest of these hellfires here, let's just kind of 
point over into its line of sight, fire them all out and see what happens. With only four targets, I'm not really expecting the greatest of things from this. I just really wanted to get the explosives out of my rear end before like, we got too close to any sort of encounters. The one thing you will note here is that it was hair's breadth from being able to uh, to get hold of that orb weaver there. If I had fired all of the hellfires that I had left when I was coming over the ridge, I probably would have done some damage there at that point. Oh well, that, that's the way these things go. But I have a much better plan, a much more exhilarating plan. Something that really is like summoning the spirit of the hover tank completely. We're going to get up, we're going to get in its face, we're going to face down that laser on the top of it and point up our middle finger and just blow it away. Coming up onto dry land, my heart rate starts going up through the roof. Now, I am more than a little bit worried about the laser on top of that thing. I know that the Vulcans are pointed too high up, and I also know that the interceptor missiles aren't really going to do much good if less than 500 meters to try and get a lock on and turn around and face me. Yeah, it's just, it's just not going to happen. But that laser, that laser on top, that could very well eat through quite a lot of this hover tank before I re react properly. It's all down to at what point does that second mark tick over. Thankfully I get round the corner, I fire off a volley and we are sound. There, there are some moments of, of worrying, especially when that laser got shot up and it seemed to still have its um, weapon manager attached to it and stuff. But going over and having a proper look, I feel like we're okay. Wow. Especially when I start busting out the Vulcan turret and blowing up other stuff. But I think we can claim this as a successfully retaken base. The only thing we really have to do now is set up some guard mode and send one of these brave Kerbal soldiers out to go and replant the flag after, of course, taking down Agonarch's one. Nissen and Tamte stand accused of treason and sabotage. General lacks effort when dealing with the vital war effort and logistics. They use their position working on war machines to bring about the downfall of several important missions. Dunham stands accused of treason and sowing discontent. He was recorded on KSTV claiming there was reason to fear defeat. This was an obvious lie and Dunham walked proudly into his just punishment. A stark reminder as to what can happen when we fall out from under the path of the dear leader's way. But anyway, on with our second and more importantly air mission. Now normally this is the one that's the all singing, all dancing mission, goes off, does some big stuff. But I have a request, or I have received a request rather. My, my good friend and ally Penguin has turned around to me and gone... Which of course being a fluent speaker of Penguinese, Twitch Yongi turned round and knew exactly what was going on and issued orders to me to go and take the undefended base of Edenside. But of course aircraft are the only craft that are allowed to have these little drop pods so I'm going to utilise that fact to try and like put some sort of semblance of defences at the, the undefended bases that Agonarch came through and had a pop at and hopefully Penguin will act upon his promises to give me defensive units and, and hopefully take over some of the defensive capabilities at Jeb's Island that is right in front of me. Uh, I hope that that will be what he does. So yeah, let's talk about the craft itself, the wretched porcupine. You will see on top I have the uh, defensive nest that has, has proved so useful recently. I, I quite like that. Uh, also, I'm using some pretty large wings here. These wings are actually the ones that have told me exactly how big the moth actually is. Uh, I've never had an up-close encounter with Agonarch's flagship of the, the destructiveness that he's got. So I never quite realised how much of a behemoth that craft is. But having a look at these wings, whoa, that vessel's big. But this craft is made more for defensive purposes, really. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of this more of a flying fortress. It's just coming along and being a roving defense unit for whatever has has need of it, which this time will be this side. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that'll be great. And to be honest, it's a good thing that I'm not really taking it anywhere to be offensive because, wow, this thing would not dodge a missile even if it was like three miles away. 
Uh, like, it rolls quite well, but it doesn't really have the power or the control surfaces to be able to capitalise on that roll. It can't really pull up as well as I would like. Also, despite there being four engines on the back here, my maximum speed is about 150 metres per second, which again, you know, for such a large craft is a, is a good thing, but it's not really going in and dodging missiles type of velocities, is it? Making our approach up to Jeb's Island Retreat, Dongus and Danrim are both looking quite unsettled to be near such a, a site of recent massacre. Uh, of course, this is the place where Agonarch came and released most of his fury upon. For two entire turns now, he's been raining down technological terror upon all my uh, holidaying Kerbals that are just here to have a good time, chill out, enjoy the beach. We all, of course, remember the story of Kerberos who lost his wife, children and, gra and granny in the, the, the last massacre. And today, well, Dan Rim himself has more than a little bit of a point to prove. But his is not a point of aggression, no. His is a point of stoicism, resilience and the unswavering resolution to face any challenge that Agonarch deems fit to rain down upon us as he has the first turn advantage. And as our last tiny robot minders settle down to the ground, I think we're going to do some cutting through this next bit. Well, mainly because I don't have the footage of this entire flight because it took a long time and my hard drive space is not infinite. So we are going westwards over the, the entire state of Northern Clothu. I did stop and get some beauty shots though. This is us going over the east coast of uh, the actual Clothulian Peninsula. It's quite nice. I, I really do like the look. If, if I actually took a moment to look to the left, we would see the Kerbal Space Center. Oh, sorry, the Clothulian Space Center. But we, we didn't look that way. We just kind of had a look at all the irons underneath us. Here we are in the middle of the great continent of Clothu, having a little bit of engine trouble. Uh, we're definitely at the very top of our, my operational ceiling here and almost all the time I'm having these little flame outs that are going. Now this is literally just a problem of intakes, I didn't put anywhere near enough on there, I'm, I'm not sure why I didn't, it was just the way it was going. One thing I will note though is even with an engine down on the far, like, far extreme left of my craft, it still holds itself pretty stable, which, which I think is kind of a bonus, right? Then finally, just a quick flyby of Black Crags, beautiful desolation that it is, and then we are coming up upon our landing of either side. Now you'll notice here that my fuel, oh my fuel, it's shockingly low. I really thought I was going to run out somewhere around Black Crags. Even now, I've only got something like 50 units of fuel across the entire plane. I, I'm not sure how it goes. We, we have literally meet, met the maximum operational limit of this craft. So that, that's quite good. It, it goes all the way across the continent of Clothu. So that, that's pretty good. If we need it anywhere at any of my bases, that is what it can do. Now, one of the things that I'd noticed last time that I was at either side was how flat all the surrounding landscape was. Now, that doesn't quite hold up true on the coastline, but thankfully enough, I don't want to be at the coastline. I want to be at either side itself. So I felt absolutely no pressure in coming, coming in for this landing. That's a big lie. I felt a massive pressure. Could you imagine if I actually smashed it up after that massive flight? Oh, wow. Uh, so, we're, yeah, we're coming in. We're trying to find out where the floor actually really starts to become um, properly flat. But I'm already well past the point where the mountains and stuff are. So I'm, I'm looking for a point that we've already gone past. That is, of course, if you ignore that hill right in front of us there. It caught me by surprise during the flight, and once again, it caught me by surprise on the commentary. I forgot all about it. But we had a little bit of a bounce. Everything seemed okay. I really did think that when that, that bounce happened, or at least for the two seconds leading up to that bounce, I was like, that's it. It's over. I'm going to smash my craft up. But no, thankfully, the landing gear held up. Everything was, was good. We managed to put down without even smashing our wings up, which... To be honest, I was expecting to lose those wings on landing. Uh, I, I was going to be like, well, my boys can come in and patch it up afterwards. No no serious thing. Because unfortunately, I can't actually take this craft in and relaunch it from either side. Because there is there is no room. There is no room for to be able to launch it off the... Uh, well, it doesn't have a runway. It has a helipad. I'm trying to get this thing off a helipad. Uh, it's just not going to work really, is it? So if this plane does exist at the beginning of next turn, which I really doubt it will, I mean, that means that Tape would have decided that something else was more important than taking back his base. Um, and, and I don't think he's going to do that. I think he was going to see this as a bit of a personal affront. Uh, of course, you know, this was done as a, peng uh, a favour to Penguin. It, was, it wasn't done under the order of Twitch Yong E much. So obviously Tape should just leave this base alone and go, go take on Penguin. I mean, he's the one who's like ultimately in need of retributional strikes, right? Honest? I'm, I'm sure Tape agrees with me as well. 
Of course, the thing that makes all these plans very interesting indeed is when I come down to slow, very slow here, and I put my brakes on, um, something very untoward happens. Now, I'm not sure what, what's going on there. I'm, I'm assuming it's just the, the dodgy physics as always. But I reckon my, my boys can come along and weld that cockpit back on there. I've got a feeling it's going to still defend itself. I, I really hope it's still going to defend itself. Um, but I can't can't take in much of this debris, else the whole thing will fall over, right? So, yeah, I'm going to leave this defending this zone here. Let's see if Tape can take on a pile of scrap, eh? Anyway, either side is mine again. And to wrap up my entire turn, my second defensive unit is indeed a second shredded panache, put, put with the first one at Ben Bay, possibly taking advantage of the limited line of sight, possibly putting myself in the same situation as Agonite. I don't know, I, I think these two being so close to each other are going to protect themselves. But anyway, that's all i got for you this time. I will see you next time when we're going to respond to whatever it is that Agonarch and Tape do. Bye!